So next, uh, we're fine, delighted to invite our final speaker, uh, Minister uh, Donoghue, who, uh, who's, uh, of course, Minister for uh, Finance, Public, Public Expenditure and Reform. As I said in my opening remarks, uh, the Minister was generous enough to, to come here four years ago and he gave a really good speech after dinner that, that evening, and I know he's been a very good supporter of us since then, and so really delighted to have him here today. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back here again on Valencia Island and to have the opportunity to address uh, you all on the topic of globalisation and the topic of where Ireland stands in relation to us. I'm conscious that it has been a, uh, a good afternoon with many fine speeches. I'm equally conscious that this is a hot room <laughs> with a wonderful afternoon out there. So I'm hoping to cover off and deal with all of my different points in around 15 minutes, okay? So I'm going to get you through my views in relation to where we are, <clears throat> look forward to the panel, and look forward to having dinner with all of you later on, and thank you for being in here with us on an afternoon like this. It's a particular pleasure to be following on from the kind of speeches that we heard from Danielle, that we heard from Sean, and that we heard from Kevin. And in my own speech, what I'm hoping to do is touch on some of the themes that they have addressed in their own contribution, and I hope weave it all together. Uh, and the reason why I am so enthused by some of the points that they have made is they have brought together so well the concept that what happened here over 150 years ago, laid the foundations for globalisation. So as I said when I was speaking to somebody, I think, in Kerry Radio earlier on today or before us, I said it won't come as a surprise to anybody living in Kerry to know that Kerry was the birthplace of globalisation <laughs> and the internet. But it might come as a bit of a surprise to others which is why the work of the Valencia Cable Foundation is so important. And if you pause to reflect on the act that we are talking about, what happened in 18, 1858, the 16 hours that involved the sending of a message, and within weeks, those 16 hours becoming minutes of a journey, that kind of change, the technology that evolved from here, and the determination that led to it happening, is in many ways reflective of the change that has happened in the modern Irish economy. Because what happened here a century ago is multinational companies then came to Valencia Island, and they settled here and they built links with the local community. They trained local workers in the new technology. And this is precisely the kind of model and exactly the kind of relationships that have underpinned the modern Irish economy and the development of the modern Irish economy over the last four, day, four decades in particular. An economic model underpinned by an enterprising environment, stability in some really important policy areas, and most importantly, an atmosphere of openness. And if we can relate what happened in Valencia Island 100 years ago to where we are today, then the question I'd like to pose is how do those insights help us with where we are now? And the kind of challenges and opportunities that Ireland has ahead of us and that we are grappling with now. And it was summed up, I think, so well in two ways by Sean's presentation. Because I actually represent Dublin Central. Half of what Sean showed in his presentation I represent in the North Docks. And what Sean said in one way is absolutely correct in that the North Docks part of our city has been transformed beyond recognition. 
But Sheriff Street is still the same. Sheriff Street itself is the same from the Sheriff Street that I knew in the mid-1980s and the Sheriff Street that I represent today in 2018. And it's the same Sheriff Street and the same North Inner City sitting beside the extraordinary policy success that Sean identified in which we have now set up a North Inner City task force to look at how we can respond back to social and economic issues that are resonant of where we were in the 1980s. So in many ways, the picture that Sean showed is entirely accurate of the change that has happened, but also demonstrates the challenges that we still have. And I want to relate that back then to where we are with globalization. Because what globalization has done, as Kevin eloquently demonstrated, is it has brought enormous benefits to the world, to communities, and to Ireland. But amidst the debate about globalization, and amidst the debate about the distribution of the benefits of globalization, is a fact that policymakers were too quick to dismiss the claim that there were losers in that process. And it wasn't a claim, it was a fact that not all have benefited equally from that process, and the benefits have been distributed in such a way that democracies are increasingly asking big questions about. And that that is a thread that is underpinning now the different discontents that democracies are grappling with. And if you look at what has happened and the way in which the financialization of globalization in particular has deepened in recent decades, what has happened is we have seen the increasing ability of capital to move so quickly across the world and the amazing ability of Ireland demonstrated by some of your speakers here today to benefit from us. But as that has happened, what we've also seen is we have seen earnings, the income that you and I receive our share of that global pie begin to decline. And in some democracies, it's declining at quite a pace. So in other words, the wages that are paid to employees as a share of national income has been in decline now since the 1980s, since this period of change begun. And at the same time, there has been a related rise in wealth, in visible wealth, and income inequality in many countries. And this has created an enduring sense of unfairness, an enduring sense of us not being in this all together. And now, right across Europe and the Western world, politicians like myself, like many of my colleagues in Europe and across the Atlantic, are now grappling with the challenge of how we ensure our economies are competitive, are attractive to investment, do create good living standards, while at the same time ensuring that all of our citizens experience this change. And as an elected politician, and as somebody who's proud to be a politician, I experienced this tension all of the time. I experienced it this morning. I spent the morning in Cahir Savine with my friend, Minister Brendan Griffin, meeting business after business who were trying to relate the connect between a national economy in Ireland that is going really well and their experience in Cahir Savine. And that's a link that as politicians we have to be aware of and have to look at how we can continue to, to address. But here in Ireland, amidst the kind of change that we are seeing happening elsewhere, what I want to stress is that our doors, our approach to the rest of the world, remains open. 
not just to investment, but to people, to ideas. Here in Ireland, we have refused to become closed. We have refused to turn against diversity, and we have refused to lower our public standards, as this kind of debate is underway. And if you look at how we have responded this, to this economically, for example, if you look in taxation, which I'm directly responsible for, one of the ways in which we have done this is through a deeply progressive and fair tax system. Because what we have seen here in Ireland is a tax code that can distribute income fairly in response to change is essential in how a country responds back to a crisis. So one of the consequences of this is despite Ireland being more globalised than the average developed economy, we have less inequality on average. And this shows that diversity and globalisation does not have to mean inequality. It isn't some nebulous force driving an unstoppable decline in inequality. Policies, as another speaker said this afternoon, matter. So if you look at where we are then from a more local point of view, something that I'm deeply aware of is how the consequences of this kind of change matter for those who are living outside of our cities and what these policies mean both directly and indirectly. Because it is clear across Europe that there is an ever-growing urban-rural divide in how people feel about these issues. And this has been expressed in elections that are taking place across the world. Now, what I'm not saying at the moment is that this kind of change is solely the result of globalisation and that it would be a mistake, I believe, to shift all of the blame there. If we closed our borders, if we turned inwards, we would still need to look for new solutions and different ways of supporting development outside of our cities. But globalisation can exacerbate that challenge. And our job as elected representatives is to strike a balance between embracing the benefits of globalisation, which I'll make the case for when I conclude, but protecting those who are at risk from us and helping those who are losing out from it. And that is why, to relate it back to decisions that I'm actively involved in, that is why we have for our country a 10-year investment plan that lays out a decade worth of investment to get our country ready for an Ireland that would be so different in 2040. It's why we have a Rural Regeneration and Development Fund in which this project here in Kerry was the largest single recipient of in your county. It's why we're using that fund to invest in tourism, in transport infrastructure, in forestry, to name but a few, to respond to this challenge. And it is why we have made a huge decision in relation to the National Broadband Plan because high-speed, reliable, digital connectivity is vital in helping communities respond back to the change that I have described. It's essential in allowing individuals and households to be much easier connected to people, to places and ideas, just as the cable from here did in 1858. And if we look at the kind of change that is now underway in the world of work, in the world of manufacturing, if we look at what concepts like distributed manufacturing will mean, 3D printing, what that will mean for the world of work, we will not be able to access that unless we have the connectivity to do it. And a prediction that I'll offer here in Valencia Island this afternoon is that in our lifetime, 
we will see the return of cottage industries. And those cottage industries will be fundamentally different to what they were in decades ago. And it is my hope that Ireland can be at the forefront of that through decisions like the National Broadband Plan. Manufacturing will become decoupled from scale. That's the next wave of globalisation. And we should be challenging ourselves to say how we get ready for that. That's why the broadband plan matters. And culture matters too. And I, I, this, of course, was a, such an important uh, theme of the address that we heard from Danielle in terms of the impact of culture and the impact on culture by communications. Culture matters, local culture matters. And that's why initiatives like the cable project are so important. And that's why I and the government are and will support you in the work on the UNESCO Heritage Status for Here, because it matters. And I, in particular, will always remember the contribution of the late Anthony O'Connell and the late Bob Joyce and their legacy to this project. And there are two reasons. And they are two reasons why we're going to make this project happen. I can still remember being in uh, Anthony O'Connell's car when he drove me up to the Slate mine, Slate uh, area, or quarry up here, and he said, Pascal, you know this is the Slate that built the House of Commons. <laughs> of course, why should I be surprised? After all, you created the internet. <laughs> So they are two reasons why we will make it happen. And then when I saw in the magnificent, and I use that word deliberately because it is magnificent, the Quirks, Quirks Bookshop in Cahir Saivin this morning, how Coleman manages to fit in such an extraordinary range of great books into such a small place. And when I saw their Pride of Place, the new book by Michael Lynn, who I met earlier on, lovely to meet him, on Tillanock, The Voices of Valencia, and saw the way that culture is brought so wonderfully to life in that book, it's a reminder of why culture matters so much. So just to move into a conclusion in relation to all of this, for issues that Ireland is dealing with now, and I've talked about the issues and response of today, and I want to conclude with the issues and challenges of tomorrow. And this is going to be relevant to where we are in 2019. I've talked about what globalisation means. I've talked about the contribution of here to that global process and what I believe the responses of today are to those who benefit from globalisation and those who are not. Ireland made the correct and strategic choice to open ourselves to this global world and it was a decision of great wisdom. And then we as a people had the spirit, the skill, and the foresight to benefit from it. But what I believe is likely to happen now, and likely to continue in the future, is the nature of that globalisation is going to change. It's going to become more fast moving, even than it is now, and it is already clearly more politically contested, as Kevin has acknowledged. And I believe our new national question will be, if we're a country that is so open and want to retain that openness because that we have benefited from it, how do we keep ourselves secure when that world is now changing at an unprecedented pace? When the volatility of that change is higher than it has been in the past? Paul Krugman, the American economist, refer to the era in which we opened up our country to the era of the great moderation. That moderation may finally be coming to a very different point and may be changing to a different thing. So that national question for us will be how we look after ourselves in that period of change. But I think one of our great challenges will be is we will be dealing with that national question 
just when we are revisiting the old national question. Because the national question that we have always grappled with and succeeded in answering is the national question of borders. The national question of our relationship with Northern Ireland, our relationship with the United Kingdom. And it will be the challenge that this generation of politicians and this generation of citizens will have to respond to is how we deal with those two questions coming together. Because that, I believe, is the period we are moving into. And I believe these are challenges that our country will rise to, and we have the measure of. And I believe the way in which we will do it is by making the case for openness built on solid foundations. Openness because Ireland is good at this. We are good at being open to investment, open to ideas, open to people. We are good at using the openness of others to generate trades and relationships in which we can mutually benefit from. It's the DNA of the last four decades of Ireland. But as we look at that openness, we will need to build us on increasingly stronger foundations. We need to combine openness with solidness at the same time to deal with this kind of change. And I believe the first foundation of this will be how we have policy certainty and policy composure in some really, really important areas. The late JJ Lee, in his work, Ireland 12, 1912 to 1985, wrote that small states must rely heavily on the quality of their strategic thinking to counter their vulnerability to international influences. Without superior thinking, they'll be buffeted rudderless, like a cork on a wave. And for Ireland, as we look at that openness and how we respond to it, I believe the first foundation will be policy certainty and composure. The policies that will matter will be how we manage international taxation, how we manage data and how we manage an open labour market and they're the first three that are coming at us and then when we look at how we want to change in those areas that's where composure will matter in terms of how we engage how we engage as a society through citizens assemblies how we engage in debates and in international matters through organizations like the OECD the next foundation of us will be strong institutions, institutions that we look after, institutions that we want to be proud of. They are part of, I believe, the intangible infrastructure that underpins our country. And too often, these public institutions have either been ignored or they've become fodder for political point scoring. At times, they have let us down but in the long sweep of our country, these are institutions that have served us well. We only have to look elsewhere to see what kind of dangerous path can be opened up when we see the judiciary, the civil service, or the administrative state become the target of sustained political attack. In defending and in renewing our institutions, I believe we must also develop a deeper sense of citizenship, of public purpose, a commitment to public service that transcends particular interests. And then the final foundation of this, and you won't be surprised to hear me conclude on this point, is the foundation of strong public finances that enable public and private investment. Twice in my lifetime, we have got this wrong. We can't let it happen again. I know how it happens. I see how it happens. It happens in tiny steps. We must make sure it doesn't happen again. And we can be proud of how we're managing this to date. 
but we can't and need to be always vigilant about it. If you look at where we are now, we have a record level of employment in our country without the kind of credit and lending boom that got us there the last time. If you look at our public finances, if you look at where we are now, a decade ago, day-to-day -day spending grew by 11% per year when our economy was soaring. For now, that figure is 4%. But we all know, and you can all hear, the many debates about this. And then crucially, as we are managing this, we have to be investing in that which can make a difference tomorrow. Our public infrastructure, how we look after our housing, how we make sure that we have a home for all who need us, how we invest in public transport, in our universities, and that which can make our economy resilient and our society give ourselves the society that a decent and rich economy wants, that we are on our way to building. And I say all of this because the political order that underpins our world can never be taken for granted. Political health, political order is fragile. It depends on consent. And the pillars upon which we have built this global order are now changing. Brexit is one of the catalysts of this change and one that will have the biggest impact in Ireland. So while I don't believe that we are at the end of globalisation, a prediction that globalisation has ended might be as accurate as saying that we were at the end of history. But it is changing. And it's very clear to me now that there will be a greater diffusion of power and of wealth around the world in this next phase. Uncertainty will grow. And this is why it's so important for Ireland, I believe, that we're clear on what matters. We're clear on our membership, our role in the European Union. We're clear on the value of openness, but we're equally committed to the foundations that I described to make sure that openness works for all. In the new world, it's crucial to be both open and solid. And this is what our country has done so successfully in the past, and it's what I believe we need to continue to do in the future. Thank you.